Timothy. Um, I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today on this gorgeous morning. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and we have a wonderful service planned for you. Um, One quick announcement before we jump up and get started. Uh, Right after this service, the youth will be swooping into the lobby, and they are selling custard. Um, Culver's Restaurant in Navarre was kind enough to donate all this free custard for them to sell. So you can buy a pint of custard for $4, and all $4 goes into the mission field. So uh, yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. So no guilt, right? You can just have the calories and feel good about doing something for Jesus, right? I think that's, that's how that works. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's how that works, but we're, we probably bought eight. eight. Yeah, not good. We're going to donate half of those? Sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure. You guys ready for a great Sunday? Awesome. I invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand. And let's, um, let's join our hearts together by praying the Lord's Prayer. Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this beautiful day, Lord, and we just, we welcome you. God, uh, into this space. We know that you're already here, but our awareness, we become aware of the fact that you're here. And Lord, we just join in your presence in this time of celebration and worship as we hear uh, Jim teach from the word. God, we just pray that that you would add things to our lives that would help us to to live out this purpose and destiny that you've called us to, to be a part of. You know the weights and the concerns that each and every person is carrying, whether we're here in person or online. And today we just yield those to you, God, and we just just pray that you'd help us to navigate through life. Um, We love you. We trust you. We know that you are the very best thing that we are ever going to find. And so, God, we hold tightly uh, to the truth of who you are. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad you're here. Worship with us today, if you would. You dance over me while I am unaware. You sing all around, but I never hear the sound. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed. How you love me You paint the morning sky With miracles in mind My hope will always stand For you hold me in your hand Lord, I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me How I How deep How great Is your love for me How How you love me, how you love me, 
Lord, I'm amazed, amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. Oh, we welcome you in this place this morning. We say thank you so much for the love that you have for us. You are amazing. Uh, God, your grace the mercy that you give us every single day. And we're just grateful this morning to be here, to have breath in our lungs. And so we give it back to you uh, in worship. God, we pray that you would bless this time as Jim Bell comes to deliver the word. We open up our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. And we give it back to you in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. You can be seated. Thanks for singing this morning. Well, it's a pretty day here today, and I hope wherever you're logging in from, I hope you have as pretty a day as what it seems like it's going to be today. Yesterday was supposed to be all day rain, remember? Anyone see any rain yesterday? Nah. You can't trust those people. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 1. One day... Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. You know, when you think about it, Jesus was a source of absolutely continuous amazement to these apostles, these disciples who followed him. They had traveled with him, they had eaten with him, they had bedded down with him, and they saw inroads being made into the darkening powers, if you will, of, of the death and despair and sickness everywhere they went. They saw, they saw changes taking place. They witnessed mighty demonstrations of power that they'd never, ever seen before. And they were continually astonished. And how smart this guy was. The wisdom that was displayed by this Jesus of Nazareth. They were always watching him. Always looking at him. Always trying to examine him to find out what was the secret of, of his power. Of what he brought to the table. Where did he get his wisdom? How did he get it? Who gave it to him? And here Luke says he was praying. And if no doubt it dawned on one of the disciples that, you know, maybe these things we see, that Jesus' amazing power was somehow connected or related to his prayer life. You know, because when he had finished praying, one of them, we don't know who it was, one of those disciples stepped up and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now that's a very, very significant request. Because these disciples, remember, were already men of prayer. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. What they meant by that statement was that some of these disciples had been disciples of John the Baptist. So they were familiar with prayer. They knew how it worked. And they had been taught to pray by John. But having seen Jesus in prayer... Uh, he was not in the same ballpark as John the Baptist. It was sort of like comparing Jesus to the major leagues and John the Baptist T-ball. It was, it was, it was main, mainly a big difference in, in how they both prayed because they knew that Jesus was a master at, at prayer. They just felt it. They just knew it. So they sensed that his character and his power were linked somehow with his prayer life. And that is when the disciples realized, well, we thought we knew about prayer, but we don't know very much at all. So they asked him this question, Lord, would you teach us to pray? That's a question I think is pertinent to you and I today as well, because a lot of us need to be taught. But when we make that request, Think about this. When we make that request, we've already taken the first step. And it's the most important step 
toward discovering the power of prayer and what it can do for you and what can it be in your life. When we ask, teach us to pray, God. Jesus, teach us to pray. We're doing so out of a sense of need. And prayer is simply, when you think about it, prayer is simply the expression of human need that goes to an eager father's ears. Prayer is the cry of a beloved child to a father who has the perfect father's heart. And he's ready, willing, able, eager to pour out all that he has to give us when we come to him in prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. We are crying that plea out of a sense of need. So the first question that comes to mind is, what pray tell, what did these disciples see in Jesus' life that prompted the request in the first place? What was it that had knocked their socks off? What was it that had so impressed them as they watched Jesus? They were like, they were like little kids watching their father, watching someone that they really were close to. How does he do it? So they're they're looking at this thing, they're wondering where did this amazing power come from? And somehow they put together the fact that, you know, there's this connection we keep seeing over and over and over again about the power, the miracles, the wisdom, and prayer, prayer, and prayer. Because one of the things they realized that prayer was not something that was just a sort of an occasional thing that he did, an occasional practice when he had time, that, that's what they did not see. They saw it was an absolute necessity in the life of this Jesus of Nazareth. Not just occasionally when I've got time, maybe if were things work out right. Not that at all. Prayer to Jesus was a lifelong habit. And everything Absolutely everything Jesus did arose out of prayer. He literally prayed without ceasing, continual. Now, obviously, it was not what we would call formal prayer. You know, Jesus didn't get on on his knees every time he prayed. He did not stand up with outstretched arms gazing up into heaven, which was the normal, proper, pharisaical way of praying. He didn't do that either, because if he did either one of those two things, how in the world could he have gotten anything done whatsoever? The amazing thing is that he fulfilled this amazing prayer life in the midst of an extremely busy ministry. And he was being pulled and tugged at in all different directions, yet he never ceased or gave short shrift to prayer. You know, when you think about it, when you read the Gospels, it's amazing how he crammed in and how he was able to accomplish so much in just a little over three years. He was subjected, and I I guess we're also subjected ourselves to a whole list, if you will, of increasing pressures and tensions and and continual interruptions. You know how how you're like when you're focused on something and someone interrupts you, you go crazy. You just don't have time for all that. Get on, we'll talk about it later, I'm, I'm focused on this. Do you realize how often, when you read the Gospels, how often he was interrupted? He never set out to accomplish anything in his life, but that he was not continually sidetracked. You know, and as he ministered, as it goes on, he, was, he met increasing opposition. It was like hecklers in the audience, you know. Can you imagine what that would have been like? And he got continual harassment as his ministry went on. Continual resistance to the course and to the things that he said to people. Yet in the midst of all of that, this incredible, in effect, busyness that was going on in his life, things were changing. He was constantly in prayer. He was praying in spirit 
when his hands were busy healing. He gave thanks as he was breaking bread and feeding thousands of people. And then there was this continual sense of expectation that his father would be working through him and therefore he was praying by his attitude continuously all the time. You know, the key to prayer in the prayer life is to practice this constant expectation of attitude, which means that we are never, ever, ever far away from the thought that God is working in us and through us to do exactly what his good pleasure wants. Now, he did this, of course, because he believed what he preached. Jesus believed what he preached. He was the one who said, quote, the son can do nothing by himself, unquote. The son can do nothing by himself. Those were not merely words that simply sounded pious. You know, they sounded holy. They sounded very humble. But that's not it at all. They were words that absolutely startled his followers, these disciples. That's an amazing statement to make. I, the son can do nothing by himself. Think of the Son of God, the absolute perfect man, the man who continually fulfilled all God's expectations for mankind, a man who was the constant delight of his Father's heart, who always did the things that pleased his Father. And ask yourself, how much did he personally, as a man, contribute to this mighty program of power and wisdom that were present during these three or three and a half years of ministry. John chapter 14, Jesus reiterates, he says, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So out of this conscious, constant sense of need, there arose a continuing attitude a prayer, a continuing expectation that if anything was to be done, it's not me going to be doing it. It's going to be my Father who has to do it. That's what underlay his prayer life. And he revealed to these disciples that prayer was an absolute necessity or nothing was going to get done on this planet. Now that's where he was. Therein lies our problem as we live today. Because, you know, you and I, we have such an unexplainable attitude of self-sufficiency. Let's be honest. There are, sure, there are times where we are conscious that we are inadequate, or we can't do something. And we're conscious that we have, we have a need in this area. And I'll tell you what, when we recognize that, we're ready for prayer. Sign us up, I'm top on the list, check the box, I'm ready to go. Whenever you get down in the dumps or you're up against some demanding circumstances in your life or, or sometimes when you're completely overwhelmed by some unexpected catastrophe that you didn't see coming but has now hit you or your family, your first response is, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray because we have this sense of need. You know you need help, and prayer is an automatic response when you run into life situations at that time. You know, but way too often we think this is only emergency action that needs to be taken. And we need to reserve this action for those times when we really need it, when we're under great pressure, great stress, or we're facing a lot of different trials and tribulations. You know, most of the time, we feel pretty adequate, and we feel pretty sufficient in of ourselves, we say things like this, well, there are a lot of things that I can do by myself. I mean, I'll pray when I need help, but the rest of the time and most situations I can really handle on my own. The secret of the life of Jesus is he never said that, never thought that. Never experienced that. He never said to himself, well, you know, I'm the son of God. Uh, my training and my background, my, my 
resume and the ability that the Father has given me as a man certainly makes me sufficient for certain things on my own. No, no. He never said that. Remember, the Son can do nothing by himself. One time, after teaching a multitude of people, Jesus turned to his friend Peter, and he said to him, put out into deep water. Put out into deep water, Peter. Peter obeyed. Peter then took the boat out into deep water. This is on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus said to him, let down the nets for a catch of fish. Now, Peter, no doubt, and you know what Peter's personality is. Peter, no doubt, looked at the Lord Jesus with amazement. And you can almost hear his patronizing words when he says to him, Master, we've worked hard all night. And we haven't caught anything. What he was really thinking was something like this. Lord, I know that you are a great teacher. You know, you certainly know how to speak to multitudes much better than, than I can and, and better than anyone that I have ever seen. You're a mighty man of miracles and powers. You're a man of incredible wisdom. But Lord, you know, when it comes to fishing, you're talking to the expert. I've been fishing on this lake since I was born. I have fished every inch of this lake. I can tell you where the fish are and where the fish are not. So, Lord, when it comes to fishing, you're talking to the expert. If you want to know anything about fishing, I'll be glad to teach you. After all, I, I've been raised on this lake, as I said, and I know. How about you stick to your preaching and let me do the fishing? Now, that's not a verbatim, but, but it's not hard knowing the personality of, of Peter and what he was facing here. That's sort of where he was coming from. But when the Lord said, let down the nets, he obeyed. There was something about his tone that was irresistible. So Peter said, well, in my heart, I still know I'm a good fisherman. But because you say so, it's more like he's saying, I'll humor you. I'll let down the nets because you say so. So he lets down the nets, and immediately you know what happens. He caught so many fish, the nets began to fall apart and break because of the weight. They hauled them all in, and there is Peter, and he's got to be up to his knees in fresh fish. And he's looking up at the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got to have this great surprise on his face. And he's got this wonderment in his spirit. And he says to him, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He realized that even in the areas of life where he felt the most self-sufficient, he needed Jesus Christ. And that is what the Lord is teaching us today in the 21st century. The one thing we must learn from this is there is no activity in life that does not require prayer or a sense of expectation that God has heard and is at work. You now, think about it. Think to yourself, this phone call that I'm about to make I can't do it right. The message is not going to get clear. It's not going to go through, except that I pray about it. It will never have the effect I want it to have, except as my heart looks up to God and says, speak through me in this phone call. The text that you're about to send, how can I do it right the report I have to give, how is that going to work out? The room that I'm vacuuming, how is that going to turn out? Which way am I going to go? 
you know, every area of life, from the simple of vacuuming a room to witnessing to a non-believer, which we would say is pretty important stuff. It's all important to God. And he says, the way you connect with me is through prayer. The disciple who asked Jesus to teach them to pray, and as I said, we don't know who it was, also saw that prayer was not only necessary, but it was also perfectly natural. Because there was absolutely no struggle on the part of Jesus to pray. He wasn't torn one way or the other. To him, prayer was not an act of self-discipline or I'm going to force myself or I've got it on my counter. It was never duty to Jesus to pray. It was always delight, not duty. Now that does not mean that the Lord did not require time for prayer. He did. He had to make some hard choices sometimes between the many, many demanding things that were coming his way that threatened to really eat up his entire life and all his time. Sometimes he spent hours upon hours, he spent whole nights in prayer one-on-one. And on occasion, sometimes he slipped away when the crowds got too voluminous, too, too huge, when they were demanding so much for him that he, that he got to the point where he says, I've got to back away and go to prayer. There was no sense of reluctance. There was no sense that prayer was a requirement that he had to fulfill. He never seemed to drag himself away from something else in order to pray. His actions arose out of an overwhelming sense of need. He simply faced up to the fact that out, without this relationship that he had with the Father, what he did was absolutely wasted time. Remember, the Son can do nothing by himself. So he could put in a lot of time. He could put in hours upon hours of activity, but it accomplished nothing. And out of that deep, urgent sense of continual need, that awareness that he had was but an empty channel, a vessel through whom the Father could do his work, that arose continual prayer. As a man, he could do nothing. So prayer to Jesus was as necessary as eating, sleeping, sitting, whatever. It was a normal life activity, probably more important than any of those things for him. Sometimes what it meant for Jesus was to give thanksgiving. Just go back one chapter and we see, we could, we could pick any a whole bunch of different verses. But you go back one chapter to Luke chapter 10, verses 21 and 22. It says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus is always, throughout the Gospels, giving thanks. He was forever saying, thank you, Father. Thank you for the circumstances into which you have brought us. Circumstance you brought me, circumstance you brought the people who follow me, the people who need me, the people who need to hear from me. Thank you for what you have planned to do about it all. You've already got it worked out. Thank you for the victory that, you will, that will be won through these circumstances. And I already know, I can claim that as a victory already. You know, as he broke the bread to feed the 5,000, he lifted his eyes to heaven. And what did he say? Thank you, Father. This is not about me. You are working through me. I can only do this because of you. At the Last Supper, as he gathered with his disciples in that upper room, what he did, he took bread, he took the cup, and after what? Giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. Changed the world. Sometimes 
Prayer was seeking counsel from the Father. Go back. When you remember the occasion when he was about to choose, very early on, before he actually even started his ministry, when he was about to choose his disciples, we are told that he spent all the previous night in prayer. And in doing so, what he was doing, he was seeking and he receiving illumination and counsel and guidance from the Father. He knew his own wisdom would be inadequate for the task that he was about to face. He simply exposed himself to the divine counsel of God the Father. And together they went about the list and talked over every single man that they were considering. And as he, in prayer, as he talked to the Father about each one of them, there came a conviction to his heart. This is the one. That is the one. And when he had finished, he had chosen 12, including the one who would betray him. For Jesus, prayer was frequently very intercessional. You know, we have a great account of it in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John where he prayed for the 11 apostles and through them for the entire church to every succeeding age. He said, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning the 11 apostles. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Do you see that one of Jesus' very last prayers on this earth before his arrest and his execution was a prayer for you? He prayed for Peter, Peter in, the, in the hour of his disillusionment. Total and utter defeat for Peter. Peter's world came crashing down around his head when he denied his Lord three times just hours before making the boastful claim, I will die with you. He was absolutely destroyed. Finally, we see his great prayer of intercession when he was hanging on the cross. His arms are stretched out wide and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Why do we struggle? Why do you think we struggle so much with prayer? Why are we suddenly so busy that prayer always seems to get placed further and further on the back burner, if you will? That's where we place it. Why do we favor prayer in the same instance we often resist it? You know, maybe even now, as you're sitting here, or you're sitting at home, or wherever you may be, You maybe find the enemy is whispering two very clever and false things to you about prayer. Has he ever said something like this to you, your enemy? Of course Jesus prayed like this, but do you expect to live like he did? Do you really think that you can live on the same level as the Son of God? Isn't it obvious to you that this kind of living is, it's out of your comfort zone. This is far beyond you. You're not in the same league here. After all, you're nothing but a simple, ordinary Christian. Do you really think you can pray like the Son of God? Have you ever heard that voice? Sometimes when you know you should be praying and you get that you get that voice and you say, well, what's the use? Because, you know, I, I, I'm not in the same league anyway. Like everything else Satan says to us, it's, it's a filthy lie. Because Jesus has said this, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. As he lived by the Father's strength, so we also are to live by the Son's strength in exactly the same relationship. There's no difference. 
Maybe the enemy is saying this to you. Well, Jesus prayed as he did because he felt a sense of need continually. You know, it is easy to pray when you feel the need, you know, when you have the emergency, when you have the catastrophe. So whenever you feel needy, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead and pray. But, but when you feel needy, don't bother praying unless you feel this sense of urgency, if you will, to, to do that. Again, that's a lie. It's a lie that sounds very pious. Because doesn't it sound pious? Well, you know, I don't want to bother God. I want to be humble. You know, I don't want to be bothering Him. Uh, so I will just take that off His plate and I'll keep it on mine. It sounds pious, but it's a lie. It really embodies what has become a widespread philosophy, if you will, which can be entitled, follow your feelings. Follow your feelings. Whatever is good, do it. In other words, don't, walk, don't bother to walk by faith. But faith is exercised in your life only when you have acted upon the truth that you have believed. That's a powerful, powerful thing to stay with you. Faith is ex ex experienced, is ex exercised only when you have acted upon the truth you have believed. Not your feelings. Your feelings are a roller coaster. Truth is always true. In other words, don't bother to walk by faith is, is, is what Satan is telling you. Faith reckons on fact. And the fact is that God reveals to us that whether we sense a need or we don't, we are indeed needy. Whether we realize or not, whether we feel sufficient or not, we are insufficient. That's hard for us to sometimes, but we, that's hard for us to take in. Once again, it's the truth of God's Word. We are continually needy, and we must reckon constantly on the indwelling life of the Lord Jesus Christ within us for taking care of that strength that we need to do our jobs, things that we were called to do by God, our ministry, whatever it might be. When we think that everything is fine, that we need no help whatsoever from God, and that life is totally under our belt and it's under our control, we are suffering from a delusion. It's a fantasy of your imagination, and it's ultimately going to burst. Something's going to take place. Life is really only under control when our attitude is what Jesus' attitude was, one of continual need and continual expectation that the Father will meet every need that we have. God is always the same. And that is where our faith must rest. So prayer then is to be our life. Prayer is to be our breath. So that no one need urge us to pray any more than they would urge us to breathe or to sleep. We know we must pray. We know it. In closing, when President Abraham Lincoln walked among the graves of the soldiers who died in Gettysburg, he said that he felt a great awareness of a need. He felt a great awareness of a need for a Savior. And he later stated that it was there at the battlefield in Gettysburg that he became a Christian. Lincoln learned to pray. And for Lincoln, the purpose of prayer was not to get God to do man's bidding, but to place man where he might come to see God's purpose and to experience the strength of God by relying on the everlasting and ever-loving arms of God the Father. Lincoln left this testimony about prayer, and he said this, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had absolutely no other place to go.
so it is with us. Today, at this very moment, like President Lincoln, is the only place for us to go as well. Will we go together? Bow your heads with me. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, be with us. Lord, allow us to look at your life. Look at your prayer life. Look at how you did life, how that you lived life. And Lord, we're amazed because we have this innate sense that we are self-sufficient of our own. And Lord, you are the Son of God and you could do nothing without the Father. How very, very little we can do without you. So Lord, we pray for this message to rest in our hearts that, that we don't set aside time for prayer. We don't make time for prayer. We pray continually as we do life with an expectancy that not only do you hear us, you're eager and willing to act on that prayer. Lord, grant us this hope. Grant us the faith that, that changes our lives. And we ask this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Hope you have a great day today. Thank you.